everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Where do we as a community, region, commonwealth, and nation rate on the civility scale? At a time when racist, homophobic, or negative gender-related comments flow freely on social media, when people scream at each other rather than speak respect- respectfully, and politics pit neighbor against neighbor, where is our civil compass? What happened to the world that Dr. Martin Luther King described in his I Have a Dream speech? Up next on Another View, we'll talk about civility in 2018. It's the kickoff to our race. Let's talk about it conversation. And it begins next. So stay tuned. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Our next Race Let's Talk About It town hall happens tomorrow, Saturday, where we will explore the topic of civility in 2018. And we will start that conversation today with a stellar panel of experts. But first, in less than eight hours, the talented dancers who make up the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater will take their places on the stage at Norfolk's Chrysler Hall. And one of those talented performers is Colin Hayward, a Newport News native who began his training at the Academy of Dance and Gymnastics on Jefferson Avenue. Our Lisa Godley spoke briefly to the Woodside High School graduate about what it means to be home. It was like a full circle moment. This was the area that introduced me to dance. I started out in tap dance, and then I added jazz the next year, and then I eventually got into ballet my third year. And then I was on their competition team. So I, I was at their studio for about, I want to say, nine years when I was eight years old. And then I left that studio when I was 17. All right. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. What can people who are going to come out to support you and to see the show, what can they expect to see? You'll see a piece called Episodes that was choreographed in 1989 by Ulysses Dove. And in that piece, it's comprised of a lot of duets, these um, diagonal I guess, lit paths that go across the stage and people are running in and out of those paths and they're clashing with the opposite sex to engage in these just go for broke duets where the men are just tossing the girls in the air and the girls are getting caught by other men. And it's a piece that will actually make you, (laughs) I guess, it'll take your breath away. The Alvin Alley Dance Theater performances start tonight at 8 p.m. at Chrysler Hall with two more weekend shows, Saturday at 8 and Sunday at 3. And it is very cool that we have someone local performing this evening. So I am so excited about our next race. Let's talk about it, Town Hall, because we are focusing on the issue of civility. The Town Hall is Saturday, March 3rd. That's tomorrow at 2.30 at the Boyd Dining Hall on the campus of Virginia Wesleyan University. It's free and open to everyone, but but please register at whro.org slash talkaboutrace. According to Webster's Dictionary, civility means civilized conduct, especially courtesy and politeness, or a polite act or expression. In his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke of a world where we all get along, even if we disagree. I'm sure were he alive today, Dr. King may be appalled at the public discourse today, the yelling, screaming, bullying, and determination to say whatever is on your mind, regardless of its impact on others. So how do we get our civility back? Have we really lost it, or are we just going through growing pains to reach the new level of civility? Here to help us unpack it all, is Jonathan Zura, President and CEO of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities. Hey, Jonathan. Hi there. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. Ricardo Menendez, who is an actor and an activist. Hey, Ricardo. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you very much. And joining us by phone is diversity and inclusion expert Michelle Woods-Jones. Hello, Michelle. Hi there. (laughs) We miss you. We're glad to hear, hear your voice again. How you doing? Well, my joy to be with you. Doing well. Fantastic. So I want to start with each of you giving me your definition of civility, particularly as it pertains to the discussion of race. So, Jonathan, let's start with you. So I think civility to me really works on a few different levels. I think that oftentimes people think about civility as being polite conversation. Um, and, And I think about 
not just stopping at conversation, but also thinking about whether or not our structures and our systems, our institutions are places in which all people can be their full selves. And so we, if we stop it, I smile at you or I don't raise my voice, but it's a completely unjust system. To me, that's not complete civility. Um, and so I think we need to work at both of those levels on the interpersonal side and the institutional side to create a space that's equitable, to create space that's fair, um, and to create space where we can work together. Okay. Ricardo. Well, um, you know, I, I, I had to look it up. I, I, I have conflicting ideas. You know, I'm, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I didn't come to the States until I was 17. And the idea of civility in the island is slightly different, uh, simply because in the, in the island we're all Creoles. We all a mix. So this idea of, of, of race differences and how do people act or react towards each other was not something that I experienced or I experienced in a slightly different way. Um, so uh, I, I run into one of the definitions that said claiming and caring from, for one's identity, needs and belief without disregarding someone else's in the process. Um, to me, yes, uh, it, it is defending and augmenting our personal values but only by bettering ourselves, not by violent bullying. Um, you know, uh, as, a, as a theater teacher, for example, I teach uh, that which we call uh, status games. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the process, we discover that there is, there is two ways of bettering oneself. One is by using what you have in order to to get what you have better to make it better mm -hmm. or by simply squishing down others uh, they have existed there are there are actions that um, we learn along the way mm -hmm. uh, as we I don't know treat pets or cockroaches <laughs> no do we stump them down do we take the spider out um, but it is it is weird that or no it is sad that at this moment um, pushing someone down in order to get yourself ahead has become the norm. Um, so in, 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 those, in that respect, um, uh, the big question about whether we have lost the civility, um, I, I want to think that we are on the process of getting ourselves better, but like in any illness, sometimes we go back a little before we have before we can move forward <laughs> michelle what about you what do you think about civility in general and then in terms of of the race discussion how that how it plays out well you know i've given thought to this question of civility really from the perspective of martin luther king's life and and, and how he behaved in the struggle civility is about uh being purposeful um and having one's eye uh, on the prize not allowing rancor and uh, um, anger and discontent to get in the way of what it is you are attempting to achieve, uh, to be able to be effective. Uh, we often think about diversity and inclusion as a process of learning to be nice to the other. Mm. But the real purpose, I think, uh, for Martin and certainly for me in the work is so that we can be effective. And if we are effective in our ability to connect one with the other, then the purposes that bring us together, what we're striving for, becomes more likely to occur. Mm. And I think that Martin's view of civility that we have lost sight of today is, how can I be effective, not when, Maybe it's about being able to reconcile. Maybe it's about being able to really listen without judgment. Maybe it's about being uncomfortable enough to expose ourselves to something that we're totally not familiar with, because what we want in the end is the unity in our ability to achieve what is best for our democracy. Hmm. Okay. Now, some people say... 
that um, this whole idea of us being uncivil started with the um, with the Trump administration when they came into office. I posit that maybe it started a little bit earlier. I want to play two clips. The first one is of President Obama speaking before Congress um, a couple of years ago. And uh, you will hear um, Joe Wilson of South Carolina and his response. There are also those who claim that our reform efforts would ensure illegal immigrants. This too is false. The reforms, the reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegally. It's not true. That was the famous you lie scream out from uh, Joe Wilson, who is a, a South Carolina congressman. That was a shocker, Michelle, for the country, I think, because the, prior to that, there had always been this whole idea of being respectful of the office, regardless of whether your thoughts about the person. Absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, since we are talking about this under the rubric of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it fits so clearly that uh, it is not solely uh, that we are concerned about individuals' shortcomings with the understanding that people really can grow and can change, but we have historically been willing to come together to go after whatever the purpose, the issue is that we're trying to resolve. And I think something really ugly, wasn't the first time in our history for sure, Mm -hmm. but really ugly that occurred was when uh, race was introduced uh, in the intersection of leadership of our entire country, that somehow it became okay to let go of the behaviors that allowed us to be civil in our discourse and to personalize uh, the individual who was bringing the message. Certainly it's not the first time. People have been rude and disrespectful to probably every president of of my life experience. But But the stabbing at the core of the dignity of the human being was far more pervasive, I think, during the Obama administration than any other time that historians uh, talk tell us about. So and one of the other things I, w- I want to bring up is do we, Jonathan, depend upon um, our leadership setting the tone? Let's play a clip of our president, current president, um, as he talks about immigrants um, and, and people and the wall in Mexico. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. When you set that up as the president of the United States, do you think that gives rise to people being able to express publicly what they may have been feeling privately all along? We've certainly seen a lot of that in in schools. So folks are talking about the Trump effect in terms of name calling in schools. The Southern Poverty Law Center did a big study. The Anti-Defamation League has seen increases in name calling. At the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, we saw from 2015 to 2017, over a two-year period, a 1,300% increase in requests uh, for services after incidents of bias, bullying, and discrimination in schools and workplaces and community groups just in Virginia. Uh, And so we're definitely seeing an increase in folks feeling comfortable saying things that they may have thought previously, but knew were not okay within the landscape of, of a civil society. Uh, so the question becomes, is it better for folks to think it but not say it or to say it so we can deal with it? And, and I'm a little bit conflicted on that. I've had some folks say, well, is that increase because more people are saying it or more people are actually concerned about it and a- a- awake to it and are now knowing that they need to reach out and complain? What do you huh. think, Ricardo? Because I, 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 I agreed with you, Jonathan. I think it's it's a little bit of both. But what what's your perspective? Well, you know, um, I I <laughs> I love uh, talking to my students, and I, I posed this question um, about uh, civility and is it lost? And he said that uh, 
our politicians are talking it. And uh, they remind me now that we all learn from imitation. Um, so then when when <laughs> what we call our heroes behaving badly uh, get repeated in the on the rest of us, um, they also bring about uh, this uh, fact that now we have with the internet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these echo chambers that allow people with sameness, same ideas, uh, same beliefs, to feed on each other to the extent that then uh, they become part of, of a mob that has that same thought which makes it a lot easier than to speak it out because you have heard so many other people saying it, why shouldn't you? Uh, without uh, any regard to whom it can hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, Michelle, um, when I was living in Philadelphia um, and we would have conversations about um, the North versus the South and people would say, well, at least if I when I'm in the South, I knew where I stood as an African American. I knew where I stood because there was no question <laughs> in terms of how people felt about race and so forth. Where versus in the North, where people would be very polite, and I know this is an overgeneralization. I get that. I'm just saying this mm -hmm. is in ter in context of of the conversation. Where people in the North, it's smile in your face and stab you in the back. So, Michelle, I mean, which one is better for us? Is it better that in society we just speak what's on our minds so people know where you're coming from, or or do we need this 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 level of of um, caring? about each other, as Dr. King talked about, uh, in order to, to live together better? Well, I would say that both of those have problems, because if you're not able to speak the truth uh, in a way that is, is respectful and does not diminish the human being you're attempting to communicate with, then you're probably not going to be effective. Mm -hmm. So to uh, <clears throat> wordsmith uh, and and behave in passive-aggressive ways is just, just as detrimental as saying to people things that are hurtful so that they, they can no longer hear what it is you're communicating, but they are focused on their own pain. So in order to heal, which I think is the bottom line of being able to be civil, one has to be able to communicate effectively. That is, one has to really hear not only what is said, but what is meant and what is felt. Mm -hmm. So I think both are problematic. We have to speak the truth to each other, even when it makes us uncomfortable. But we have the responsibility of being sensitive to the fact that we are communicating with a fellow human being who has feelings and fears and uh, <clears throat> limitations just like ourselves. And so we cannot compromise uh, uh, the notion of respect, of allowing one to maintain their human dignity, of being focused on wanting to communicate versus to abuse and beat up people because of our own pain and sense of dismay. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. We're talking about uh, civility in 2018 and in it, the title of the race, let's talk about it. Town Hall is creating a more civil society. Is the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King um, a, just a dream? In other words, Dr. King, Dr. King put said things such as, um, "Out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope." Or I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. He talked about, Jonathan, civility. He talked about civility in, in terms of people being treated, I think, with fairness. He also talked a lot about justice. So Letter from a Birmingham Jail was in mm -hmm. many ways a critique of the polite politic of a lot of white clergy who were not standing up for justice. And so I, I think sometimes uh, Dr. King's message can be used to regulate uh, politeness or not. So we, we say like, well, I agree with their message, but I wish they would say it differently versus actually addressing the fact that someone is protesting a rabid injustice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so 
people talk in Virginia about the Virginia way and how politics is engaged in Virginia. Well, that's what led to uh, significant, you know, the closing of Prince Edward County schools, the Virginia that's, way. And so, like 17. Yeah. Damn, so yeah. is, is civility actually Dr. King's end goal? I'm not sure it is. I think his end goal really was around justice uh, and around equity. Mm -hmm. Civility was in some ways one of the levers through nonviolence that he was able to use to get towards that end, uh, particularly when contrasted with some other approaches. Uh, But I think we don't get his full spirit and work if we stop at saying civility is the goal. goal. Correct, correct. I I believe it's, it's a tactic. It was a tactic to get to that sameness idea and that idea that we are all equal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to open the conversation let's be civil about it let's respect each other have the curiosity to know what others think the curiosity and be able to talk about it correct let it happen let's go to alan in virginia beach hi alan you're on the air hello Um, i want to make a quick comment or a question or a real good question here um uh, so from what i've uh, looked at civility or civilness is tied to citizenship, the context of citizenship, and one, it, you know, and then it, in 16th century, it got turned into politeness. My question is, how was King, how was anything that he was saying tied to that concept? Because he was really trying to get uh, 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 African Americans, Black Americans to become citizens, to actually become citizens. So my, my question is, like, how can, how can we even interject the word civility, civilness, into Dr. King's legacy when he was about justice, righteousness, as the, as, the, as the guy just said, but at the same time, he was trying to a- actually get us to become and be treated fairly like citizens. We weren't being treated as citizens. So how is that? How is that congruent? You can't be you can't be civil if you're not a citizen. That's, that's, okay, let's let the panel do, uh, answer you. Thanks, Alan, for the call. Michelle, you want to tackle that one? I think the issue of civility is not directly uh, attached to. Um, uh, his desires for equity, uh, for justice. He was not uh, uh, myopic. He was multidimensional. And so when he talked about um, things like justice, he was talking about uh, uh, justice in terms of fair wages. He was talking about justice in terms of civil rights, people being able to live in safe neighborhoods, having a job. Uh, a good job and fair wages, being able to take care of their children, uh, those kinds of things. So to, citizenship uh, was not the, the, the primary focus, because at that point, all of the people were, in fact, citizens, but they were not being treated with justice, and they were not being treated in an equitable manner. And his, his view in terms of, of being able to be civil was, to, in my view, was about being able to be effective in coming together to make those kinds of changes that needed to be made. And his view was that if we come at each other with rancor and anger and yelling and screaming, uh, that we will not be able to be, listen to each other and find common ground. We cannot be conciliatory if we are unable to communicate. Okay. Anybody else want to respond to that? Well, you know, I think in, in the time period, uh, you know, I think things like the bus boycotts were experienced by some people as being wholly radical and uncivil. Mm-hmm, um, sure. and, and so uh, today we look back and say, well, that was the peaceful, nonviolent approach. And there were other approaches that were less so. I'll be curious about 20, 30, 50 years from now, if people look back and say, well, Black Lives Matter, for example, was a move would they see that as a radical movement or was, well, was that, that a peaceful movement? was that peaceful <laughs> relative to what other folks may have done yeah. uh, during the time period um I, I do think going back to what you had asked earlier also about the current political context i think we are missing that moral voice um and that mm-hmm. grounding that uh, whether it's a political figure sometimes it's been a religious figure has been able to provide for a community during times when we feel afraid we look to our leaders and in this case we don't have modeling that helps us you know, move towards our, our better angels or our, our better instincts. Uh, and so I think that's been one of the challenges as folks are feeling especially frayed and, and not having some direction in this climate. Yeah, that is correct. I mean, I think, you know, uh, it's just that when we, when we look at, if we look at history like, or this uh, events that happened, 
uh, as an illness in history. And we, uh, in, it's exactly what we do when we are sick. We acknowledge it exists, then we take our medication, and then we, we kind of check, we monitor the progress, and we understand that sometimes uh, the sickness gets worse and then it gets a lot better, but we are working towards it. So, mm. yeah, we, we haven't achieved it, uh, but this, uh, I think that what makes uh, Martin Luther King an important figure in our history is that that which he started has been the medicine that has developed these other ideas. The fact that we're still talking about it is it 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 is witness to the fact that we acknowledge is still happening. I guess a better question, or as an educator, is how do we prevent that from going back again? We're going back the other way. Mm -hmm. We've been taking that medicine for a very long time. Mm -hmm. If you're just joining us, we're talking about creating a more civil society as part of our Race Let's Talk About It initiative with Jonathan Zur, President and CEO of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, actor, activist Ricardo Menendez, and diversity and inclusion expert Michelle Woods-Jones. Let's talk to Carl in Norfolk. Hi, Carl. You're on the air. Hi, hi, Barbara, and thank you very much for taking my call. Uh-huh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can barely hear you. Speak up a little bit, please. Okay, I'll try to. Is this any better? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, uh, as we talk about Dr. King, I, I think one of the things that uh, came up in, in our fraternity meeting was that people like Marion Addison were more respected by us than for her talent uh, in this country. For him, it was equality, and uh, that's, yes, he, he did not expect, he would not have expected the comments about people from the White House that we're now getting. Mm. Uh, he, he, he saw life as a level, level uh, playing field. And I'll take my response from your audience on there. Okay. Thank you, Carl, for the call. So Carl is saying that he that Dr. King would would not expect the type of rhetoric that we have out of the White House today. Yeah, I, I don't think the policies that we're seeing today would necessarily have surprised him, given the policies throughout history. I, I think the rhetoric feels like it has an edge to it that, mm -hmm. that certainly I haven't ex experienced and others have, have spoken to that as well. Um, and so, again, the question goes back to your north-south example earlier. Is it better you know, if the policies are consistent with some policies we've seen from other administrations, but the other administrations were more polite about it in, in terms of their public messaging? Is that better? I don't know. We, we're at this moment where I think we've seen uh, the increase I mentioned earlier at the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities in terms of requests. We've also seen a massive increase in people wanting to volunteer and people wanting to donate and people wanting to get involved. And so we are at this mobilizing moment, uh, whereas 10, 15 years ago, we may have seen some of the same policies, but the lack of uh, obnoxious comments coming out of our leaders meant that people weren't mobilized in quite the same way. You know, I find it interesting because I, I, I'm trying to think back and throughout my own life, I don't remember so much um, our leadership speaking about specific groups in the same way. We have another clip from... Um, uh, President Trump, when he was running for office, I want you to take a listen to. No group in America has been more harmed by Hillary Clinton's policies than African Americans. No group. No group. If Hillary Clinton's goal was to inflict pain on the African American community, she could not have done a better job. It's a disgrace. Look, what do you have to lose? You're living in poverty. Your schools are no good. You have no jobs. 58% of your youth is unemployed. What the hell do you have to lose? Wow, Michelle. I mean, when you hear that, <laughs> oh. does it does it still? I remember how I felt the first time I heard it. Was it, how did it make you feel when you heard it again? I still bristle, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it uh, it causes me to just uh, almost want to be sick. Uh, and, and in light of uh, of Martin, 
he, in my view, would have uh, rebelled against this uh, this kind of speech, which is sort of a pimping, if you will, uh, and a lack of understanding of the wide range of individuals who come under the rubric of black people, African Americans, whatever term you want to use, and the notion uh, that we are all uh, unemployed and and suffering. The truth of the matter is, too many uh, of us are. And what has been offered um, uh, during the time of the uh, of these speeches and so forth uh, wasn't anything to hang our hats on. And I think Martin, who promoted uh, quote whirlwind end quote of revolt, but with a moral compass, was always um, sensitive and aware of the importance of both dignity and discipline. Um, meeting the physical force as well as the soul force of how we behave as human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think these kinds of uh, vulgar, brass, uh, uh, insensitive statements are part of the reason that there is so much work to be done, um, not only in terms of, of healing, but in terms of clarity of what the real facts of life experiences are in America so that we can come up with the policies Jonathan was alluding to that really make a difference. There's an article uh, in uh, The Atlantic called Sometimes There Are More Important Goals Than Civility, written by Van Newkirk II. And the the ultimate goal or the, the um, ultimate point of his article is that sometimes, particularly for communities of color, that civility is an, a way to keep the conversation from ever happening. What do you think about that, Ricardo? I'm sorry. That, in, a, in other words, if, you t if you're civil and you're polite, then you don't bring up ugly issues of race and you don't bring up those things that, that intertwine with that. And so therefore... It, it can be used as a way to never have the conversation but as opposed to keeping it going. Correct. But it, it's just that civility is not necessarily politeness. It's, it's strongly claiming and caring for what one believes and one needs. It's just the manner in which we go at obtaining it mm -hmm. is not violent. Um it's uh, in, you know, responding to uh, the clip that we just heard, and I think Michelle talked on, uh, about it, is um, I, I teach my actors that action denotes character, that I only know who the individual is on paper because of what his actions are. Mm. So when, we've, when we look at our politicians at the moment on actions, then we make we make an assumption of who, what the character is, and by character I mean the moral qualities of an individual based on their actions. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously I, I, I think very little about people that behave or speak in this manner, um, especially from a, from a podium, from a, a, a place where other people are, are listening, other people are searching for someone to believe, to side with, and this is what we hear. It, I, I find it almost irresponsible. Um, I just want to talk, uh, uh, touch a little a moment on something that Jonathan said about uh, the counteracting of it, um, the amount of uh, volunteers that we see uh, investing into the community. And this is kind of personal. Um, you know, Puerto Rico was hit by a horrible hurricane. And uh, as crazy as everything was about uh, FEMA, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that happened, what the, the hope for me is in the fact that we as a nation, the American citizens, were so, so giving, so generous to that little island that is part of the United States and that, you know, it's 135 miles. But the help, the strong help, the strong support came from the citizens of the United States of America, mm -hmm. not necessarily our politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it means that the people are still trying to connect mm -hmm. and, and to make it happen, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I think that there is this moment, you know, we see this with the Women's March and some other things, there are folks who are standing up in ways that they haven't before. I think that the challenge is that the need for them to stand up is not new. 
Um, so the, the issues have been there, but the let's take advantage of this moment uh, while we have it. You know, I also think about um, William Barber, who is leading the Moral Mondays movement out of North Carolina. And people think about him as a prophetic voice of our time, similar to Dr. King's, um, has talked about the fact that if I am holding someone underwater, if I'm drowning them and they flail their arms up and hit me, I can't complain that, well, you're being uncivil. You're, you know, you're, you're hitting me as I'm, as I'm drowning you. Right. Um, and I think some of that is, is what we're struggling with when we try to regulate um, how people go about standing up to one another. So would I love if every conversation I had was polite? Absolutely. That'd be very nice. And the reality is that there are times where folks need to be uh, more direct uh, and maybe even more aggressive. And sometimes it doesn't have to be to persuade. It may just be to state the fact from that yeah. person's perspective, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we, we it's it's about listening to s- other people's ideas and not being reactionary, but trying to find the common ground. When do we where do we agree so that from that point we can try to solve our differences mm-hmm. in the most efficient way? Let's talk to Christine from Anancock. Hi, Christine on the Eastern Shore. How are Hi. you? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Um. Okay, I taught online for about 20 years, mostly on the college level. And I know sort of a marked increase in um, students being disrespectful when we, in the early 2000s, when the U.S. invaded Iraq. Uh, and then that sort of moved in uh, to into the Obama administration. Um, I taught a government course that I really didn't want to teach anymore after one term because some of the students were disruptive and it was just sort of um, not really teaching government. It was managing some behavior. And so I think that, uh, and this is, I taught history and humanities. So this is some of my other courses. Um, my other courses were fine, you know, in terms of behavior. Um, I think that this trend has, has, has gone back certainly to the early 2000s. That's sort of culminating, I hope. <laughs> I hope it's culminating during the Trump administration. Okay. Thanks so much, Christine, for your call. I saw you as another teacher, <laughs> Ricardo, laughing <laughs> yes, well, in terms you know, of managing those uh, behaviors. <laughs> because I, I mean, it is, a, it is a personal belief for me. Um, I always tell my students, if all I do is repeat what I already know, I stop learning. And my idea, I, I want to be a student for all my life. So I, I urge their opinions, um, except that we put a rule on it. Um, one makes an opinion become an argument, and that is facts. Mm. So I'm always like, I welcome your opinion, but please tell me why. How, did you, get, how did you get to this conclusion? And a lot of the times when you make them think that way, they realize that they are repeating some ideas that they learned someplace or heard somewhere, but never figure out why do other people thought that way. They're just repeating what they have heard before. Mm-hmm. Um, so that idea has helped me a lot in, in the classroom opening because it is important to hear what the new generation has to and say. And Jonathan, you're in the classroom also, and I, I was uh, reading an article about a um, a class out of Maryland where they're actually teaching civility mm-hmm. as a part of the, the whole discussion about how to teach children how to get along with each other. Um, you know, you go from a... Uh, toddler, you know, the little kids mm-hmm. who all play with each other because it's just let's mm-hmm. day, there's a friend, let's just mm-hmm. go play. And then as they move up the ladder, that's where these differences start. What are you hearing in the classrooms now? Yeah, so I think what we're seeing in some ways is a, a perfect storm over the last 10, 15 years. If you overlay a movement towards testing in schools, that means that we're not actually engaging in critical thinking, we're not doing uh, dialogue, we're not exploring things from multiple perspectives, we're teaching to a test in many cases. And a social media culture, which only reinforces the things that I believe. So it's curated that if I like a certain thing, I'm going to see more things that reinforce my belief. Those two things together do create an increased polarization where I only want to believe what I believe. And I'm never challenged to be to explore other perspectives. And so we really try to help students to slow down and to think about how they can build skills of empathy, to build skills of dialogue, to uh, not just be on their phone communicating with others, but also talking to one another. And I think that, again, is a foundational step uh, that we need those skills. That's not Mm -hmm. going to solve all of the challenges that we face in society, but we're going to be... 
that much more challenge to be able to address them if we don't get that foundational piece right. And Michelle, when we when we look at family, you know, kind of as a whole, um, if you're still if the children are still hearing conversation from the adults in the family that may not be positive towards bringing us all together. I mean, is there ever a point where a generation will be there that will kind of reinforce the good stuff mm. <laughs> on the other end? You know, I think that uh, Martin would be deeply wounded by the way basic human values have been gutted. Things like Mm -hmm. personal integrity, honesty, values we claim to embrace, yet we don't follow them. And children see this. As the young people in Florida, they see what we say, but they are really watching what we are doing. Uh, The lack of grace, of compassion, of forgiveness, the diminishing of the foundation pillars of, of truth, of keeping commitments, the loss of courage to be open, transparent, uncomfortable, and willing to pay the price for standing up for what you believe and to advocate for others. These are also all a part of the issue of civility. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was that moral compass that he sort of carried around uh, in in the way in which he behaved uh, that, that is the civility I think he was talking about. We have more manipulation and purpose Purposeful deception uh, um, uh, nowadays. That who do we believe? What do we believe? Right. Um, communication is disguised as, as as truth, while we spin misperceptions. It's those are the uh, uh, issues that cause us to be unable to have civil discourse. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk to Nancy from Chesapeake. Hi, Nancy. You're on the air. Amen to the last comments. Yay, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> Honestly, I, I mine is very much about this because I somebody once asked on Facebook, "Are you teaching your children not to be racist?" And I thought about it and I thought, "No, I'm teaching my children to be open and honest and respectful to all people." And I think it was very specific in the in the Facebook to to black. Mm-hmm. And I want my children to be the kind of young men that are respectful to any human being. And what I was going to talk about here is that. What I am saying, I have children that are very um, defensive of people that are being, uh, you know, mistreated. They're very Mm -hmm. good souls. And part of the reason why is I didn't teach them that. I taught them kindness, and I taught them genuine respect for other humans. But in this situation, my challenge with my kids now is they are getting so very angry at the haters, Mm -hmm. and they're becoming hateful. And what I'm trying to do now is help them realize that all human beings have both the potential for good and bad, both evil and good. And it is what we feed and what we support and what we encourage in ourselves and others that makes the difference. Okay. And I'm not seeing enough of that in our media. I'm not seeing enough of that in our leaders. It's there, but I'm looking for a Martin Luther King or Obama or somebody that can help focus all the energy of the, you know, what I'm seeing is two sides of hate. Got you. Nancy, I hate to cut you off, but we're almost out of time, and I want to give our panelists a chance to respond to you. Thanks so much for calling. Jonathan, she's saying she's seeing hate on both sides. So I think there is a way in which we're demonizing the other uh, and creating, as Chimamanda Adichie says, a single story. So I I hear someone say something, and I decide, well, they're just racist, or, oh, there must be part of this political party or that political party, and as a result, I dismiss them entirely. Mm -hmm. And, And instead, I think the harder thing to do, and I'm not perfect at it by any stretch, is to pause and say, how is it that they came to that conclusion? And I think about the world completely differently. And if I really step back and reflect on the context, then there's an opening to really try to seek to understand and to be understood uh, versus to immediately dismiss or write off another person based on a limited piece of information that I might have. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Ricardo? Well, you know, I I think (laughs) the perfect storm gets created. um, And this is then our opportunity to help those young people as uh, our, our phone uh, person um, talked about. Um, let's, 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 let's teach them that you are claiming and caring for what you want, but y- there's no need to disregard some, o- some other people or be violent about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think I know I am extremely fortunate because uh, on the high school level, I teach at the government school for the arts. Um, and what I teach 
is both curiosity and empathy. Mm. So I have the luxury to use my class time to talk about those things that are not on your as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it uh, when I post this uh, these ideas to one of my to my students, um, one of the first answers was, "Well, it's just that it, now it starts." I or she said, "I understand now it starts with us, because those adults that are leading are not taking the steps necessary." which makes it very proactive. So um, she's moving she's moving forward. I don't want to cut you off. I want to get Michelle's comment coming in because we're just about out of time. I can't believe. But the conversation continues tomorrow, which will be great. Michelle, your last thoughts on this uh, issue. Well, I think Martin would be hopeful uh, on a couple of fronts, and they're more recent events. I think he would be uh, uh, extremely hopeful uh, when looking uh, at uh, the young woman who is our uh, youth uh, uh, poet uh, uh, laureate, mm-hmm. um, who uh, talks about uh, how uh, we need to provide opportunities for us to start listening to one another. And that is the key to start listening, listening to, one, to one, another. one another. Absolutely. You know, I really appreciate all of you. We are less than a minute away um, f- before we have to move on to our next segment. But uh, the conversation will continue tomorrow at uh, Virginia Wesleyan uh, Boy Dining Hall from two th- at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. It's free. It's open to everyone. And the conversation will be, even though these lovely folks we have here with us today have lots of opinions, the conversation will come from the audience. So come out express yourselves and we would love to have you be there michelle woods jones thank you so very very much for being with us jonathan zur and ricardo menendez and we'll be right back hi this is essie patha merkerson from law and order you are listening to another view And welcome back. For four decades, the women who make up the Chesapeake, Virginia Beach alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated have worked diligently to make their community a better place. This sisterhood of college educated, primarily African American women do so by sharing their time participating in national efforts to stomp out sickness and disease through giving in the form of numerous academic scholarships and through mentorships. Our Lisa Godley takes us to Delta Academy, just one of several mentoring programs where the Deltas share their gifts and talents with our community's youth. All right, ladies. All right, now that you guys have your pens and your notebook, take some time to write yourself some good affirmations, and then we're going to share them with one another. Dear Addison, I would like for you to always remember that you are beautiful, you are smart, You are kind, you are respectful, you are very well behaved, you are hilarious, you are confident, you are amazing, you are caring, you are athletic, and you are intelligent. Always remember that. Some of the things that we've touched on is things like self-esteem. We taught them things about Martin Luther King. We taught them things about personal hygiene and why it's important to take care of yourself, to love yourself, so it's just really things that we feel like a big sister can teach to a younger sister. Courtney Kearse and Sequoia Green are Deltas from Norfolk State University who come out once a month to help members of the Chesapeake, Virginia Beach alumni chapter mentor the young ladies who attend Delta Academy. This program, designed for middle school girls, has been around for almost 20 years and has made an impression on mentees like Danielle Stacy and Amari Louvier. I've gained the knowledge of how a lady should act, how women should be, and how we should like present ourselves in front of society and the expectations that we should live up to and what we shouldn't live up to. 
I've learned that you can meet your goals with hard work and effort if you put your mind to it and you're like really focused about it and that you can be anything you want to be regardless of what other people say and what they think about you. For high school girls, there's the Delta Gems mentoring program and to empower young males between the ages of 13 and 18, there's Embody. But Chapter President Andronette Ingram says mentoring is just one aspect of this organization's public service. Our purpose basically is to promote and provide services and support to local communities all over the world. We focus on our public service initiatives. For an example, economic development. We recently had a financial fortitude workshop dealing with insurance 101 and also student loans. We have educational development. We have international awareness and involvement. We have physical and mental health initiatives. And particularly doing that, we participate in a lot of the area walks. And we also have political awareness and involvement. It's no wonder the organization's nearly 200 members are so excited about being able to celebrate four decades of service to the Hampton Roads region. Immediate past president Teresa Baker is chairing the upcoming celebration. The theme for the celebration that will be held on March 17th is 40 years of dedication, service, and tradition. A tradition the young ladies of Delta Academy are extremely excited and very thankful to have around. Why do you think it's important to incorporate these things in your daily life? So we're gonna start with this table. I'm respectful, I'm patient, I am nice, I am selfless. I am confident, I stand up for others, I stand up for any and everyone. I'm hardworking and for a child of God. Other people won't let you know when you're doing great, but it doesn't mean that you're not doing great. It doesn't mean that you're not beautiful. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. So you have to be the main person to tell your, yourself these things, right? <laughs> For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. The Delta Academy teaching young ladies to believe in themselves. In celebration of the Chesapeake, Virginia Beach chapter's 40th anniversary, the Deltas will hold a scholarship gala on Saturday, March 17th at the Chesapeake Convention Center. For more information, log on to cvbdf.org. And let me invite you again to continue our conversation on civility on tomorrow, Saturday, March 3rd at 2.30 at Virginia Wesleyan University's Boyd Dining Hall. It's our next Race Let's Talk About It Town Hall in partnership with Virginia Wesleyan University and the Virginia Beach Human Rights Commission. It is absolutely free and all are welcome to attend. We would appreciate it if you would register at whro.org slash talkaboutrace. And also so Jonathan uh, Zura and Ricardo Menendez and Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander will join us tomorrow for that conversation. So please come on out and let's finish talking about how we can practice civility and yet have honest conversation. That's what it's all about. And be sure to tune in next week for the end of an era. Our next show will be the final show of the original roundtable members, Roger Chesley, Carol Pretlow, Bill Thomas, and Will LaViste. After nine years, this roundtable is moving on. We'll take a fond look back at some of the awesome conversations that we've had over the years. So be sure to join us for that. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And who is that? Kamaria Mason answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Hope to see you at the town hall tomorrow. And thank you so very, very much for listening to another view.